This is Coding Math, Episode 51, Pseudo-Random Number Generators, Part 1. Now, it may come as a surprise to those new to programming, but generating random numbers is actually pretty hard. The whole concept of how computers work is that they take input, apply some algorithm to that input, and provide the output of that process. There's no algorithm that will produce a truly random response. Because if we use the same input and the same algorithm, we'll always get the same output. The best we can do is generate what we call pseudo-random numbers. This is where the connection between the input and output is sufficiently unpredictable that it seems random. However, at some level of inspection, that randomness will break down and a pattern will appear. But there are some pretty solid algorithms out there for pseudo-random number generators, or PRNGs. Actually, there's also such thing as a TRNG, or True Random Number Generator. These often rely on some kind of specialized hardware that does some physical measurement of something unpredictable in the environment, such as light, or temperature, electrical noise, radioactive material, etc. As a note, for the rest of this video, if I use the word random, you can generally assume that I'm talking about pseudo-random. Now you might be thinking, we already have math random in JavaScript, why would we need something else? And the best reason is that most PRNGs are deterministic. This is to say that you start with a seed value, which is used to calculate a new random number. This new random number becomes a seed for the next number, and that becomes a seed for the one after that, and so on. So every time you start with a specific seed, you'll get the same sequence of random numbers. Using different starting seeds gives you different random sequences. But the built-in math random function has no way to seed it. There's no way to get a repeatable random sequence. This can be important in applications where you want an unpredictable sequence, but you want to be able to repeat it. Maybe in a particular game level, you want the bad guys to come in from several different random directions. But every time you play that level, they should come in from the same random directions. Or some algorithmic art piece where you want to try some different random placements of elements. But once you find an arrangement you like, you want to keep those positions while you tweak other aspects of the piece. Now, an important characteristic of a PRNG is its period, or how many random numbers it can generate before it starts repeating itself. Remember that because each number is generated from a seed, which is the previous random number, once you get a repeat, you'll be stuck in a loop, repeating the same series of numbers over and over. Another aspect is distribution, which is to say how random are the numbers. If the numbers the generator generates tend to be more high than low, or low than high, or clump around certain values, or avoid other values, or form some kind of pattern, then the usefulness of the generator is diminished. A final concern is how easy it is to predict the sequence. This is extremely important for security applications that use PRNGs. So there are special crypto libraries that are able to generate series of numbers that are very difficult to predict. We're not going to worry much about that one. Now, there are many different PRNG algorithms. There are libraries for most languages, including JavaScript, that are easy to use and will generate very high-quality random number sequences. Your best bet is to use one of these, but it can be useful to know some of the concepts that are going on under the hood with them. So let's look at a couple of relatively simple PRNG algorithms. The first one is called the middle square method. In this method, we take a seed number of a certain number of digits, let's say 4. We then square that number. At most, the result will be eight digits, but if it's less than that, we'll pad the left digits with zeros to make sure we have eight. Now we take the middle four digits from that number, and that's our new seed and new random number. We can square that, pad it if needed, and take the middle four digits again for our next seed, and so on. Let's try coding it. I'll set a variable called digits to four, and a seed variable to a four digit number, one, two, three, four. Then I'll make a function called nextRand. This will first square the seed and convert the result to a string and store that in a variable called n. Now I need to make sure this gets padded out to eight digits. So I'll say while n length is less than digits times two, n equals zero plus n. You see that we've set this up so we're not stuck with four digits, which will be useful later. Now we can do some string manipulation to get the middle four digits. We'll need the start and end indices. For start, we'll say digits divided by two. But in the case that digits is odd, we'll round that down using math floor. The end index is start plus digits. 
the new seed will be n substring start end. But we'll need this to be a number, not a string, so I'll wrap this in parse int. Finally, we can just return seed. To test this, we can just set up a for loop and log the result of next rand 20 times. And there we go, 20 random numbers. Not bad. If we want values from 0 to 1, like in math random, we can create a next rand float function. In that, we'll call next rand and then divide by the maximum possible four digit number, 9999. Now let's see what the period looks like in this. In other words, how many numbers can we generate before we start getting duplicates? Using a four digit number, we know that at most it's going to be 10,000. Let's see if we can get anywhere close to that. To test this, I'll create an array called results. I'll loop through a number of times, say 10 to start with, and get next rand, storing in a variable called rand. Then I'll say results rand equals true. But just before I do that, I'll test if results rand is already true, meaning we've already added it. So this would be a duplicate. If it's there, I'll simply break out of the for loop. Then after the loop, I'll log the value of i, which will be either the limit of the loop we just created if we didn't find a duplicate, or the number of iterations it took to find a duplicate. Now, since we'll eventually be running some large loops, I'll add the comment no protect up at the top here. This is a JSBin thing and it prevents it from cutting short long running loops. Okay, we run this and for 10 iterations, no duplicates, great. Jump to 100 and we get a duplicate of 56, not good. Let's try a different seed, 9600. Oh no, only four iterations before we get a duplicate. How about 2500? Bam, that just instantly finds a duplicate. If you go through the algorithm, 2500 squared and padded is 0625000, and the middle four digits are 2500, so there's your duplicate. So this is not a great algorithm, at least not for four digits. But remember that we made it flexible. Let's change digits to 10 and give it a 10 digit seed. I'll also fix up next rand float so it divides by the maximum possible 10 digit number. Okay, at 100 passes, 1,000, that passes too. 10,000, hey, we're in business. 100,000, okay, so it breaks down right after 14,000 for this seed. Let's try another one. Okay, that gets us to just over 4,600, not so great. Now, in general, with 10 digits, you get a period anywhere from 10,000 to 50,000 with this algorithm. Some seeds would get you a little bit higher, some much lower. Now that might not seem all that horrible, but let's do another test, a visual test. In the HTML, I'll create a canvas with an ID of canvas and a size of 600 by 600. Then in JavaScript, I'll find that element by ID and get the 2D rendering context. What I want to do now is loop through every pixel of this canvas and randomly color some black. That's a lot of pixels to do in a single loop. So I'll do it row by row. I'll create and call a function called draw. And I'm also gonna set a Y value of zero up here. Then I'll loop through from zero to 600 on X. And I'll call next rand float and check if this is less than 0 0.5. Should be a 50% chance of it being so. If it is less than 0 0.5, I'll draw a one pixel black rectangle at the current XY. At the end of the loop, I'll increment y and see if it's less than 600, the height of the canvas. If so, I'll call request animation frame to draw the next row. Now, starting out with a seed of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0, you see that we get a few rows of decent random looking dots, but it quickly goes into a very predictable pattern. Now, with some seeds, it might eventually go all black. With some, it might go all white. Some that I've found will produce some more interesting patterns, but you'll be hard pressed to find any that look at all random for any length of time. This is just not a very good PRNG algorithm. So let's look at one that's a little bit better. This next one is called a linear congruential generator. 
This one has a lot of history and has been used in a lot of different languages and systems as a default PRNG, including several versions of C, C++, Visual Basic, and Java, to name a few. It's also a super simple algorithm to implement, and it's pretty fast. Looking back, though, we now know that although this algorithm is far superior to the middle squares method, it's far from perfect. There are flaws in its distribution, and it's totally unsuitable for any type of security or cryptography uses. Still, its speed and simplicity make it one you might want to keep around for a quick and easy PRNG. In addition to the seed, which the user will provide, this algorithm will need three other values. A multiplier, an increment, and a modulus. We usually call these variables A, C, and M. The algorithm is dropped at easy. Multiply the current seed by the multiplier, A. Add the increment, C, to it. And then mod the result by the modulator, M. That's your new seed. So what values do you use for these three parameters? Good question. There are certain criteria what makes good values here. Poor choices give you a useless PRNG, and good choices give you a decent one. I won't go into what those criteria are, but you can look them up easily enough. We can look on the Wikipedia entry and see what values have been used in different systems over the years, though, and try some of those. Well, let's grab one. The glibc one looks promising. It was used by the GCC compiler. Let's try that. I'll make variables a, c, and m, and plug in the values from the chart. For m, I'll say mathpow2,31. And I'll set c to 1. Then our next rand function is really simple. We say seed equals a times seed plus c mod m. Excellent, a one-liner. Then we just need to return seed. We can update our next rand float function as well. The maximum value that could be returned here is just under m. So we can divide by m to get a value in the range of 0 to 1. Now we run this with our canvas visualization, and it looks pretty good. Well, better. If you step back, you can see a definite pattern in those dots. It also helps to try different sizes bitmaps. For example, if I just change the x loop to run to 550 instead of 600, the dots line up differently and the pattern really emerges. Changing the seed doesn't help much. We get a different sampling of random dots, but they continue to form the same general pattern. This is the same thing that was happening in the middle squares method. It's finding a duplicate number and repeating the same loop of random numbers over and over. Here, though, the loop is much larger, but it's still not very suitable for a PRNG at this point. Let's try some different parameters. Going back to our list, let's try this one from numerical recipes. I'll plug in the values here and run it. And this looks pretty good, actually. I don't see a pattern here. And this seems to work fine for all the seeds and all the bitmap sizes I've tested. Testing the period with that original for loop method, I was unable to find any duplicates in 10 million iterations. My testing method was too slow to go much beyond that before timing out. But in general, the LCG algorithm with decent parameters should give you a high enough period to not have to worry too much about duplicates and loops. As I said, there are still some flaws in its distribution, particularly when getting into more than two dimensions, but probably not anything you'll run into in most cases. So now you understand a little bit more about what pseudo-random number generators do. In the next video, we'll look at some pseudo-random number generator libraries that are already out there, and how you can use them in your code.